Hi there everyone, today I'm reviewing the Panama Papers, breaking the story of how the rich and powerful hide their money, by Bastian Obermeyer and Frederick Obermeyer. So the synopsis of the Panama Papers reads a bit like the plot of a thriller movie. Two journalists from the German newspaper the Süddeutsche Zeitung get access to terabytes of data 11.5 million documents and 214,000 records of offshore companies, revealing how some of the world's richest and most nefarious people move their money. How Mossack Fonseca, a Panamanian law firm, helps very rich people to avoid tax by creating often hundreds of shell companies in offshore tax havens. But this is no thriller although it often reads like one. It is a true story, and the authors of this book, the two brothers Bastian and Frederick Obermeyer, really accessed this data from an understandably anonymous contact named John Doe. This contact had access to terabytes of emails from Mossack Fonseca and shared it all with the two journalists. The company had made pains to hide their activity and their client's activity, often using pseudonyms for clients and themselves over email. They had it set up exactly as an ex-CIA investigator stated is often the method that is used but in this fashion. The creation of hundreds of shell companies to obscure where and what the money was, thus being able to hide the names of any involved and what it was really for. If the worst case scenario occurred and someone was on their trail, they could simply deny any involvement with the companies because there's no record of it. This plausible deniability came to the fore when, as the journalists started asking questions to try and probe further, Jürgen Mossack denied any involvement to the journalists over email, despite being listed as one of those involved with the company's creation. The flow of the book is as follows then. We tend to find out some detail that then unravels, often into what the evidence is, what their relationship to Mossack Fonseca was, and what exactly the implications are. Often the evidence suggests that those named were doing highly illegal things, or it's heavily implied, and that Mossack Fonseca was working with serious criminals. When the book gets good is where it illustrates and dissects how Mossack Fonseca say one thing and are clearly doing the opposite. For example, in having no relationship to clients and then clearly the data from the email is suggesting otherwise. Although it isn't necessarily advanced in terms of this analysis, it's really clear and concise. So FIFA, the German banks and ex-Prime Minister of Iceland, friends of Vladimir Putin, are all identified in the documents. Perhaps that rich individuals are gaming the system to save money is unsurprising. But when the German banks are identified in this as helping people dodge tax and it becomes more nefarious due to the institutionalised and structural implications. FIFA saw Sepp Blatter's resignation and the revealing of scandals but when huge national banks are willing to move money from drug smugglers, cartels and even armed terrorists, it becomes rather more terrifying. As the book quotes that Stefan Willeke wrote in Die Zeit, should Deutsche Bank be regarded as a criminal organisation as a result of these allegations and evidence? I've seen some commentators mention jargon being a problem in this book, which is strange to me in the context of how this book is written. When talking about financial corruption, tax havens and bonds and shares, there's bound to be some terms that are difficult to understand for the layperson. And the book does a good job of explaining what they mean and not derailing the book's flow. And that's all a reader could ask for really in this context. Not that they don't get mentioned at all, as it would just make the book difficult to write. It would be impossible to explain how exactly the corruption operates if that were the case. So to conclude, I don't think there is much jargon, and where it is precedent, present, I should say, it is deconstructed well for the lay person. Where criticism is valid is that some of the colour of the book or the stories are a little tedious. 
The authors included some parts about dealing with the sheer volume of data, having to buy a $17,000 computer to simply process and organise the vast amounts of data that John Doe was sharing with them. And so the subject matter sometimes is slightly dry, since it's important to understand also how exactly these people are manipulating the system and avoiding tax and slash or obscuring their activities. The journalists' difficulties with handling the data or their fear when they reveal it to a select group of journalists to help work with the papers will probably be of little interest to readers. Although personally I didn't mind it too much, there is definitely a bit of tedium in this. The exciting thing about the Panama Papers then is that the system has evidently been working well that so well for them that there is perhaps some complacency that kind of built up. They clearly didn't expect the quantity and quality of data such as this to get leaked despite all their precautions. As a result we even see some of the dilemmas that Mossack Fonseca faced in managing their clients and maintaining secrecy about what they were doing. One client claims to have lost all access to their bearer bonds with which the money was being held and so wants to actually get the money for them. The problem with this is, is that if Mossack Fonseca paid out the bonds and then miraculously the bearer bonds reappeared or the client found the kind of access to them again, amazingly, then they could be asked to pay up twice and the bonds would sort of be proof that they need to pay. So do they trust the client or just hold their ground and not pay out? Similarly, another client causes quite a fuss about the level of secrecy. Predictably, the kind of people wanting to hide all their money usually have some kind of reason for wanting to do so. And so Mossack Fonseca are forced to assuage the client with the merits of their encryption and secrecy. The Panama Papers is effective as a discussion and expose of what these documents are and their implications. However, any analysis of the inequality, the issues with resolving the problem and the rich versus poor debate never really develops from anything f far from being shallow in this book. The book sometimes delves into these issues, but it doesn't really go past simple acknowledgement of rich people cheating governments and people out of money equals bad. Similarly, towards the end of the book, it devolves into a bit of a strange deviation, arguing that capitalism is effectively enslaving people. Although this is a topic that always divides people, and kind of without giving my opinion, I'd say the book didn't really need to even go down this path, and was probably just better off illustrating how the wealthy and immoral are gaming the system. So in terms of the aftermath of the Panama Papers, the Panama Papers led to Mossack Fonseca having to close nine offices, 6,500 taxpayers and companies are being investigated or were, and, uh, and I quote, countries have recouped more than $1.36 billion in unpaid taxes, fines and penalties as a result of inquiries sparked by the Panama Papers according to the ICIJ's latest tally end quote, and that's from the ICIJ website itself, I'll put it in the description. And the source is about the nine offices, 6,500 taxpayers, is from the BBC. The practice of tax havens and offshore companies remain then, but as the authors note, so long as some people are willing to break the silence, there's always a chance that someone's going to leak all this information and help shed light on criminals engaging in these kinds of activities. So in terms of final score for the Panama Papers, the details of this book really surely point to wider problems. Institutionalised, permissible ways the wealthy are able to avoid what the average person has to pay, contributing to the inequality gap, since there are loopholes that, if you have lots of money already, you can pay for to help your wealth spiral even further and avoid tax especially. This book is not a criticism of capitalism or any other competing methods, although sometimes it tries to be, ineffectively I should also add, but it is a story of injustice that is important and riveting to the curious. This book won't be for everyone, but everyone should know what the Panama Papers are and why they're important. So I'm giving this one a 6 out of 10, it does a decent job, it sort of deviates to some tedious bits, but it's still a very interesting topic to me, so it gets a 6 out of 10, it's a kind of 
slightly above average, but um, I'm reviewing many more books across a range of genres, so like and subscribe, and thanks for watching.